and die. I've never seen this before. Well, you and I are in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah, I can use the keyboard to control selection. Just ask Nico what she wants. Uh, anyway, I'll be away for a bit. Yeah. You guys need me? Just ping me. Yeah, no worries. Uh, <laughs> as I said, James, we should have brushed up when you're, you're Scottish at some point because th th this person here is who you're voicing, but they're not currently talking at the moment. The person on screen? Yes. Oh. Ah, it's gone. Yeah, sorry. Oh, oh there it is. Back. Okay, it's back. It's back. Uh, okay, so, uh, Nika, make, first of all, uh, Nika, read the text below and then make your choice. Okay. Could I trust George with this rather sensitive piece of falconer knowledge? Alright. Hmm. Oh, did I do it? Yeah, you read the text. Uh, mm -hmm. Just make a choice with this dialogue. Oh, stay quiet to minimize the damage. I'm sorry, Captain, but I'm not liberty to discuss this matter any further. He gave me a steely look. This is a man grown accustomed to getting what he wanted, and he clearly didn't enjoy his situations, on the contrary. You cannot imply that the colors may somehow make mockeries of, a human, of our human form and then simply refuse to rationalize our statement. I made no statement and meant to imply nothing at all. In this instance, meaning and doing are quite separate. Human until otherwise proven, what does that mean? He loomed over me a dark and authoritative. A less woman might have buckled. It is no one's interest to that this discussion any further, Captain. Seize the Jesus immediately. He stared at each of the several long moments, two fierce wills equally matched, neither giving ground. Finally, George gave a deep sigh and looked away. This isn't over, Miss Winter. Yet for the sake of a more urgent matters, I will respect your discretion for the moment. I was forced to swallow my old sigh in relief, less than several me to be weaker than George supposed. Duly noted. I took a deep breath and tried so steadily by trembling hands. That's when I remembered the object I picked up after George's fall. A comb. A lady's comb made of silver. I hadn't been there my way into mine. I would have noticed it. Had Moonlight been carrying it with him already, or had he picked up from the mine prior to my arrival, prior to his encounter with Biddy? I opened my palm and swallowed it to him. Have you seen this before? George looked clearly caught. But in his credit, he didn't attempt to cover up any his description. I I found it in the shed over there just before Biddy interrupted me. He motioned to the remains of a wooden structure from asunder by the blast. No, 
not the sort of thing you'd expect to find in a mine site, is it? No. He took the comb from me and chucked it in his hand. Jimmy Corbett's body was found in that shed. And no, I don't think it was a falling rock that carried the skull in. Why not? George nodded and he headed the comb back to me. That's quite a way for a rock to be propelled, even by an explosion of such magnitude. And for it to still retain a lethal velocity, that's highly unlikely. What was Jimmy doing over here when the shoulder had been mining the explosive? My question exactly. George pointed to the com and gave me a rather apologetic look. I was going to talk to you about that, by the way. And after the rather heated row with Biddy, I clean forgot about it. It's understandable. Actually, no, I don't think so. Not under the circumstances. Do you know who it belongs to? Unfortunately not. Such combs are quite common here amongst the women folk. Do you think Jimmy might have had a visitor? Did he have a lady friend that you knew of? Jimmy wasn't a talker and he tended to keep to his own company. If he did, he certainly didn't boast about it. He pocketed the comb and looked back at the moonlight of mine. A dust has cleared through the reveal the tunnel mouth, now almost completely filled with rubble. It seemed that we'd Find no more answers from here. And let's assume for a moment that someone made sure Jimmy was distracted for the time it would take for the explosives catch, run fuse out to save distance, and detonate. Can you think of anyone who would want to shut down the moonlight mine? Though in his civil exterior felt firm, I could see the anger bubbling beneath. I think both you and I know who that might be. George pushed his jacket back from his gun. Shall we apprehend our suspect? No, Captain. I will go speak to Betty, see what uh, she has to say for herself. You will go and make sure no one strays into the bush and stumble upon a dead collar and a pile of dead town folk. George didn't look too happy about being ordered around but nodded and uh, soothed his jacket back over his gun. Be careful, Miss Winter. Biddy is likely expecting you. I'm sure she is, and the reception I get will tell me more than anything she has to say for herself. With that, I headed back into town and made for Biddy Ramshackle Hut. Didn't make it that far. Biddy found me first. 
The first bullet took a chunk of a bark and a garbage tree of my right. The second in the dirt in front of me and splattered mud all over my boots. I froze, keeping my hands well away from my guns and searched the street ahead for the shooter. There she was, hunkered down behind a barrel of water, her antique pistol pointed in my direction. Clever! She knew my bullets weren't going to make it through that much liquid. Billy Goodwin, either your age questionable as your drinking habits, or you're trying to tell me something. I didn't have nothing to do with that explosion. Interesting. What explosion, Biddy? Don't play dumb with me, Falconer. All right. And it wasn't you who slung its stick and the dynamite down one of the ventilation shafts. Who just tried to drop several hundred tons of rock on myself and the captain. No, it bloody well wasn't. You put down that pistol right now. I don't know how more these came from, the, but suddenly sunlight was in my side. I had not heard the approach, not even sensed her here. Understandable, since I was currently staring down the barrel of Biddy's gun. Something crossed Biddy's face in a slight of Mary Sutcliffe. Was it surprise? No, not surprise. Here. You hear me, Biddy? You drop the pistol and get out of here before something happens that we all regret. I do that and this hair falconer is going to put a bullet between my eyes. I looked at Sunlight who gave me a reassuring smile. Seemed like she was confident a peaceful solution was in the offering. Yet, Biddy's reaction, it troubled me. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of things, Biddy. If you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to fear. It was again, this time with Lodge and Biddy's face. Looked like she did have something to hide, but what? Alright, let's do this out in the open then. I've got something I want you and Sunlight to take a look at. It's nothing dangerous. I'm going to reach into my pocket real slow. I'm going to take it out and I'm going to hold it up. Is that fine with you, Biddy? Well, since I ain't gonna drop my gun like Sunlight here once, and you're not backing the hell up, I guess we'll just have to see what's in your pocket, won't we? Thank you, Biddy. I promised. I reached slowly into my pocket and drew out the comb. 
I held a loft where it sparkled just a little under the one sun. Besides me, sunlight whispered. That's Maggie Matthews' comb. Where did you find that? I didn't think it wise to tell the whole truth at this point. I needed to see what Biddy and Sunlight would volunteer first. Moonlight wine. Any idea any Maggie would be frequenting the mine? It was a flicker of something in the sunlight's face, like a child caught out doing something naughty. And then it was gone, replaced by the ever charming smile of hers. father does a good deal of carpentry for the mine. Perhaps she was delivering something for him. The comb simply slipped out of her hair. Perhaps. But I'm not in the business of speculation. I looked at Biddy. She was squinting at the comb, taking on that uh, special angry potato look only she appeared capable of. And once her eyes focused, it was clear she knew exactly what I was holding. She tricked me. Who tricked you, Biddy? Maggie Bloody Matthew. Maggie was a sweetheart. She wouldn't deceive or hurt anyone, Biddy. Now I knew that wasn't true. A sweetheart doesn't uh, go around trying to stab spreading men in the back of his shizzles. Something was unraveling here. All I had to do was keep picking at it. How, Biddy? How did Maggie trick you? She told me she wouldn't hurt him. The lion bitch told me no one would get hurt. That's enough. I'll not have you speaking ill of the dead, Bridget Goodwin. It seemed as if Sunlight would prefer Biddy not to speak at all at this particular moment. Huh? Him? We're talking about Jimmy Corbett? Biddy pointed at Sunlight. Ask the bloody matchmaker there. She knows all about it. Is that true, Sunlight? I'm simply defending the decency of a girl who can no longer do so for herself. Very good of you. Now the truth, please. Mackie Matthews and Jimmy Corbett. What went on there? Sunlight lowered her brows and scowled at Biddy. Then she shrugged in hesitation. It was quite a departure from her usual reposition. Maggie was seeing Jimmy at the same time that she was courting Weka. Did you tell her to do that? He did. needed a way out of Moonlight, and I thought it wise to increase her odds. Didn't do Jimmy's odds any good, did it, you meddling cow? 
If you ever want to drink in this town again, Biddy, you hold your tongue. You will trump the barrel top to her first. Fear was the fast turning to fury. Jimmy's dead, along with all those poor bastards down in the mine. That's no fault of mine. Anger cleared overcoming sense, Biddy stood and leveled her pistol at sunlight. Her arm was steady and I could tell that sh the shot would be true. At this point, a hero might have stepped in front of sunlight, placed themselves between the damsel and the death. I'm not a hero, I'm a falconer. There were two ways that I could handle this heated situation. One was to try to talk the gun out of Biddy's stand. The other was to shoot it out. I've been trained well and was sure I could hit the pistol and not the welder. Pretty sure. Alternatively, I could try to get Biddy to listen to reason. But from my experiences with her so far, listening and reason weren't high on the old woman's list concerns. Think carefully, Biddy. You pull that trigger and you're as good as putting a noose around your neck. No worse than I deserve, Falconer. And why would that be? Because I'm a goddamn fool, that's why. I let that bastard King George trick me out of my land, and then I let that conniving little wench trick me into helping her. Monkey, how did you help her, Biddy? Reckon I'll just take my shame to the grave with me. An old woman's gotta have some company in her. A gunshot shattered a window plane on my left. The bullet struck Biddy's pistol, knocking the clean out of her hand. Bloody shit. bolted down the close alley. A second shot ranged out, shattering the lantern just shy of Biddy's shoulder, and she flew past it. A third shot hit the Callahan that Biddy ducked behind before it vanished into the woods. I spun and I drew my own guns, leveling them to the shoulder as he stepped out into the porch. Gun down for the crime of saving a lady's life. Yes, that would be good and true colonial justice for you. Please, Cassie, holster your guns. Wicca was simply protecting us, as a gentleman should. The first shot was protection. The second was third. That about those. Considering the first shot I made, do you really think I'm in the habit of missing? Wicca had kept shooting so that Biddy would keep running. He neither wanted to make sure she didn't keep fighting, or he wanted to make sure that she didn't keep talking. Why don't you yet profess to understand your habits, Wermu? I holstered one of my pistols, but kept them at the ready, tapping the barrel at against my thigh in a steady tattoo. I understand that you going to hand over that gun of yours, though. Wicca smiled as if he expected nothing less. 
It was a Henrik lever action disappeared, beautifully maintained and polished. Considering Wicca's recent past, I wonder what poor Fort Ellen resident was currently missing their prized weapon. He tossed it to me and I caught it with my free hand. No need to ask where you learned to shoot like that. The Taranaki Land Wars. How many British soldiers have had met their end at the brush tanks of Wicked Jones? Then again, how many Maruri had met the same end defending their homes against the invading army? Wicca had his ghost and I had mine. I wasn't manning on collecting any more today. Can you track as well as you can shoot? I'm a little rusty, but I'm sure the trail of a drunken Irish woman would prove too much of a challenge. Are you planning to go after Biddy? Yes, but first I need to ask you something, Sunlight. Of course. Anything. Where did you come from just now? For a moment, she simply stared at me as if nothing com comprehending my words. Miss Suncliffe? Uh, from the hotel, of course. Of course. Then I suggest you spread this message on your way back there. Stay at home. Bolt your indoors. And please, follow that uh, advice yourself. Sunlight took a step back and regarded me with an alarm. Why? What on earth are you planning to do? We and I are about to chase Biddy into the forest. We may only find her, or we may find something else. Now it was Wicca's turn to be alarmed. Great. A gambler and a falcon will walk into the forest. Sounds like the start of a bad jerk. My answer was to hand him his rifle back as I continued with sunlight. I just want to make sure the town's secure before I go and finish out even more trouble. Consider it done. She hitched the skirt as she turned and hurried off in the direction of the hotel. I took the chance to steal a glance at the boots and uh, at them and her dress. Mud and leaf mold on the boots, the same on her hem. So much for sunlight's uh, alibi for the time of explosion. When we can I returned, if we returned, I, I'd be having further words with sunlight. I led the way following Biddy's trail into the bush. As had been the case with Maggie, I could sense Biddy's path, the fear of anger. She was having her awake. I glistened in the disturbed leaves and broke twigs like fresh blood. Shouldn't I be leading the way, Cassie? 
It's what a tracker normally does. That was an excuse, Wermo. I can follow Biddy's trail just fine. I see. Keeping your cards to get you a chance, right? Exactly. We stopped in clearing. Biddy had veered off towards the mountain. Most likely he was planning to take refuge as one of mine's shafts. I'm uh taking it that you overheard a bit about Maggie and Jimmy. I did. And did you know about it already? It came up in conversation, yes. The day she died? He sighed and nodded. Luca was carrying some heavy guilt around with him. Adam, he wanted to press him for more details about Maggie's last moments. In the case, there was some small clue in the last might lead into the cedar. Another part wanted to spare him for more pain. And not just out of sympathy. Whether he liked it or not, I'd adopted the Wika as my second shooter. I needed uh, him calm and steady. Uh, uh, interrogate Wika. I think you should tell me a little more about that last lesson of yours in a giggling glade. If I must. Yes, you must. Look at grimaced at the thought of revising his last moments with Maggie. I felt sorry for him, but I couldn't favor the feeling of one over the safety of many. She told me she needed me, but I already knew about Jimmy, that they'd been seeing each other long before I rode into town. She didn't need me, she just needed someone. Did you call her that? She tried to tell me that Jimmy didn't mean anything to her, that I was the only one she'd ever truly cared about. Did you believe her? Wicca shook his head. Maggie was a good liar. One of the best I've met. But that was stretching it just a little too far. So she tried to turn everything back on me. Called me a liar. Claimed that I promised to take her away from Moonlight. Did you? A moment of speculation is not a proposal. I see. What if Maggie actually thought differently? That was the problem with Maggie. She thought and she thought and she thought. Problem is, believing in a lie doesn't make it any truer. If she wanted out a moonlight so badly, why didn't she just leave? No horse, no money, uh -uh. and her father, he'd have never stood for it. He'd have chased Maggie, and when he'd caught up with her... He didn't 
didn't want to say it, but his eyes told me as much as I needed to know. She asked me to kill him. Her own father? He's not a good man. You're not a murderer. No, but Maggie did her best to make me into one. By threatening to tell her the town third raped her? Now there's an ugly word. Any uglier than murder? Hmm. I suppose not. And Maggie's father wouldn't have been the first one to come after you. The first would have been a shot in his self-defense as you tried to get him out of town. I believe that's what she had in mind, yes. Then she begged me not to make her go through with it. Said she had done too many things already. What sort of things? She wouldn't tell me, yet she tried to tell me that we were the same. That I'd been in the war, done things I wasn't proud of, and that she'd had to do the same. It was becoming clear to me that, wittingly or not, Maggie had been the Cedar's trail, a puppet to be directed at devastating effect. What happened to her, Cassie, after I left her there? A collar took her. It was there, watching us? Seems like it. Stranger part of it is, why didn't it take you both? You could have done that. Easily. I rested my hands and my guns ready to draw if I had to. He glanced nervously at my guns, then back at my face. He was wrestling with something. It's tapu to share that knowledge with Pakiha. Forbidden? Why? There was an agreement struck between Maori and Tanifa. How can anyone take a peace with the colors? They're monsters. They want us all dead. Not the way my grandmother told it. No? In her stories, Maori and Tanifa lived peaceably. That doesn't make any sense. I've heard that Maori villages been hit just as badly as colonial towns. Yes, it all changed. When? No one seems to know for sure, but it was about when you lot turned up. Us? Lot? Pakiha. Europeans. If something like that existed, a pact between human and color, I would have been told about it. Maybe. Maybe not. How would knowing something like that affect your ability to hunt colors, Cassie? Would it make it easier? We could have had a point. Just the very idea that people could live in peace with colors. Oh, already I was wondering, how could they done it? What sacrifices, if any, had that had to make? If the Maya could do it, why not the European settlers of New Zealand? 
Could there be another way to end the slaughter? A peaceful way? No, the Order of the Falcons could never tell me such a thing. It would make me think twice, hesitate before pulling the trigger. A single hesitation could be my last. No. I didn't think so. We could sigh deeply, as if unloading a crushing weight from his shoulders. We laid an ambush for some of Jackson's forest rangers near Patarangi. I had a dozen warriors with me. The rangers had twice that, yet we thought we could take them with the element of surprise. Let me guess. They weren't as surprised as it, you young they did be? Wika scowled and shook his head. They surrounded us. Three of my boys were dead before we could even find cover. Two more soon after. The rest of us found a rocky outcrop we could defend and dug in. I expected the rangers to wait us out until we ran out of water. But that night, we heard the screams, the gunfire, and the cries of dying men. The dawn brought us a sight I will never be able to forget. A color. At sunset, one of my men, Ariki, prayed to the Tanifa, using an old Karakia to call out to them to help us. Seems like the Tanifa were actually listening. You think it was because of this pact between Maori and Color? All I know is that they killed the rangers, not us. In the order of the Falcons knew about this. Why the hell wouldn't share it with their Falconers in New Zealand? Why wouldn't they tell me? It doesn't change anything. There was still a color out there, one that murdered a dozen people, perhaps more. Just because it sparse your life doesn't mean I should stop hunting it. Justice needs to be served one way or another. Wika looked at me, clearly waiting up his next course of action. If he was a cedar, now could be the time for him to try his luck. No witnesses, just him, me, and the native birds to sing our lament. The colonial government and I aren't really in agreement on our definition of justice, Cassie. I stopped being a colonial the moment I pinned the falconer badge on my chest. What they did to you. Or your tribe. It wasn't right. But your fight's with them. Not the people of Moonlight. Not Maggie. Then what about Biddy? How does she fit into all of this? I think I was about to find out. Right before you started talking, post holes at her. She was going to shoot sunlight. Do you really think Biddy would be stupid enough to murder someone in a broad daylight? She's an alcoholic, not an idiot. You don't think she would have pulled the trigger? She wanted us to 
think she would. It's her way of uh, protecting herself, making sure that no one crosses her any more than she'd already been crossed. She's lost a lot, has Biddy. I think she's just determined to keep what little she has left. I took my hands from the gun and rested them on my hips to show him that he wasn't planning to shoot him yet. Short of putting a golden bullet into him as he what happened, I wasn't sure that I could get the wasn't the cedar. That's, of course, assuming that Biddy is still Biddy. She could be a Tanifa wearing a skin cloak? It was my turn to be startled. A skin cloak? Is this some more of the Maori and the Color Love Festival? I wish... I've been told about? Wicked face grew. Thunderbolts and anger boiled inside of him. Like you told me the truth about how you became a falconer? You ask so much of others. Force us to confess. Relive mistakes. We wish to live in the past. And yet you offer nothing in return. What of God, I scrabbled... To defend myself. Duty was the first shield I could lay my hands on. Everything I do, I do to protect this country and the people who live in it. This is not your home, Cassie. Don't pretend to understand it like my people do. I had to admit it. We could have had a point. No, I wasn't a native here. I was shipped here across the sea like so many other colonial children. Brought here to explore the promises of the new land. New to us. England had only learned the New Zealand existence some 200 or so years ago. Yet, here I was. Here we all were, making ourselves at home, thinking a little, if anything, of the people already living here. In England, the colors had long since the has been conquered. Only in the few remaining wilds, there were occasional sightings, rumors of monsters in the midst. Most the intoxicated visions had Bored farmers, but investigation would still churn up in the cedars hunters every now and then. Out here, on the fringes of colonial civilization, the wilderness was vast and the brands of colonization was so thin, so fragile. Of course, the Maori had made their peace with the colors. Had they not, the Western world might never have seen the Maori be on bones and greenstone surf artifice. And again, the nation of England had never shaken hands with the claws, nor had the European nation of the annals of the falconers were inaccurate. So, what was I to make of people who drew alliances with the monsters that I and hundreds of falconers like me had sworn to exterminate? Perhaps the Maori thought themselves allies when the fact were thralls. They wouldn't be the first people to fall into that trap. Or perhaps they'd generally found a way 
to live in peace. What the colors? Uh, admit the possibility of peace. All right, Wilmo. I apologize. It's not for me to pass judgment on your people. Sun broke through the thunderclouds and Wika's face broke into a smile. Now that's not something I ever expected to hear out of the mouth of a colonial. Falconers are sworn to protect the colonists of Europe. Doesn't mean we have to agree with them. Apparently not. I smiled. Look at me with respect. I shouldn't help but smile back. Now, if you don't mind, Wermo, could I trouble you for your thoughts on um, Tanwa and their skin cloaks? All right. We've long known that a Tanifa can walk along and walk among us, look, sound, and feel just like one of us. We say that they're wearing a skin cloak, wearing the guise of humanity, like a chief might wear a cloak of Huya feathers. It's a disturbing way of putting it, but yes, Biddy might be of a cedar wearing skin cloak. If that's what Biddy is, a cedar, then how do we kill her? We don't. I kill her. Wicker pointed loaded his fire with a smooth switch of its lever. As you've seen, Cassie, I'm a pretty good shot. Perhaps even better than you. I know. That's why you're here. But, uh, you're still not going to be able to kill it. Why not? You don't have a gold bullets. Short of completely obliterating the thing in fire, an explosion, or maybe pulverizing it, gold is the only thing we found that will hurt the color. Damn. Then what am I supposed to do? Throw bad language at it until the thing surrenders out of embarrassment? You can cover me. The color won't know if you're firing golden bullets at it or not. It'll keep its head down, just in case. All right, I can do that. I gave the whole the nod gratitude and headed off into the bush with Wika close behind me. We trekked for some time long enough to see the biddy was circling back towards the mountains, towards the moonlight line. Long enough to know that we weren't alone. I stopped, stood stuck still with my hands hovering over the handles of my guns. Cassie? What's wrong? I scrutinized the bush around us, searching for any telltale movement. Was it Biddy? No, I didn't think so. Her trail was unpanicked and oblivious. Unless she doubled back on us. But why? She had no weapon. Unless 
she was the cedar planning to dissolve the human form, swarm us with her centipedes. No, the cedar's work wasn't done in the moonlight. Too many lives remain. Too much strive still to excite. Then what? The hunter? I got my answer soon enough. Draw those pistols of yours nice and gently and toss them over there into that patch of ferns. Do the same with your rifle, Weka. I could see her out in the corner of my eye looking at us down the twin barrels of a shotgun. If she unloaded both barrels at once, the spread a shot would cut us both to ribbons. Wick and I were going to have to play along for now. I did as I was told, tossing my guns into the short distance of the ferns and nodded to Wika to do the same. Thankfully, he did as he was told. Sunlight? Why are you doing this? It's not sunlight. Hasn't been for years, more, most likely. Damn it! I should have gone after her when I noticed the mud and the leaf mold in her boots. I need a choice to go after Biddy to hollow the most obvious quarry. The mistake of an apprentice, not a badge-earning falconer. I'm as much sunlight as Mary Suncliffe ever was. Or so, I imagine. I didn't know that creepy crawlers had the imagination of their own. I thought you simply stole them from us. Humanity, we've never seen a more arrogant species, a creature more convinced of its own self-importance. Soft little mammals who believe they hold all of our world's secrets in their squishy little brains. You had, ch you had your time, Color. This word ours now. Oh, I don't think that debate's over quite yet. Or a beast of its statue, its sheer bulk. It had expected the hunter's color to rustle in underground like the deer might, or to cause a crackle of its launched cross of the forest poor like a pig might. Instead, the monstrosity appeared out of the forest without the faintest to accompany sounds. One moment, it wasn't there, and the next moment, it was. An apparition that was all too real. The moment... Bloody hell! Easy, Wermo. If you try to run, you'll be dead before you'll meet a more than a couple of steps. Actually, the Falconer's wrong about that, Weka. What do you mean? She's the only one who needs to die. You're free to go. He is lying to you. How do you know? It's what cedars do. Lie and manipulate. Turn us against each other. Now there's an interesting use of us, Cassie. You. 
a Pekahe, a thief of our land, a raper lusting after the wealth of Tain Mahuta's kingdom, placing yourself in the same waka as a son of Maui. Us colors humanity. It doesn't matter about the contours of our skin or the language or on our tongues. We are human. You, you're a monster. Mika took a step towards the sunlight, putting himself between me and her, a wavering shotgun. Wermo, what are you doing? He ignored me, his attention focused solely on sunlight. All right, Tanifa. Tell me this. If you let me go, what's to stop me from simply going to other falconers, telling them all about you, leading them here to hunt you down? You fought for your Winua, Riermu. You've seen your people die for your Etiroa. I fought against soldier sunlight. Men sworn to drive us from our homes. I didn't murder innocents like Maggie. Sunlight laughed, light and merry, wholly human, but with the faintest scrape and sort of a thousand manbills. There was nothing innocent about Maggie. What did you do to her? I told her what she wanted to hear. That she would get to ride off into the sunset with a big, strong, beautiful man. You lied to her. Fed her false hope so that she'd be your bidding. That it, color? nothing false about what I offered her. In fact, she achieved her dream. With Jimmy? <laughs> That's right. Quiet, strong, sensible Jimmy Worry. He would have happily packed up and left town with Maggie. All he needed was a little push. The accident? Was it Maggie? Did she set off the explosives cache? I don't tend to trouble myself with logistics and details. Humans can be remarkably independent and resourceful when it comes to their self-destruction. She looked to the hunter color, extended her mouth wider than was natural, and emitted a wholly inhuman blurring from her throat. The hunter responded immediately, raising its arms, lowering its body, ready to attack that would be us, both dead in the moment. We looked where the guns lay in the currents. Too far. Much too far. Sunlight's mouth returned to some resemblance of normally as she returned back to Wika. This is your last chance, son of Maui. Walk away. Live your life and remember your history. That history is long gone, Color. Wicca knows it, and so will you. Cedar had made a mistake. By calling for the hunter to prepare his attack by focusing all of his attention on us. She'd left it obl oblivious to George's approach. Yes, he'd been quiet. 
far stealthier than I had expected, yet they were still human. That much was now clear. Kill him! <laughs> the spring forward, forcing Weaker and me to dive out of the path and bore down the moonlight. Yet, George neither cringed nor fired. His military experience came forth and calmly tossed his golden fob, watched it into air and shot it with his pistol. The hunter passed through the clouds of glass, shards and golden sprung, wailing like a spring aboard and the golden shower his compound eyes. It was the judge's turn to die to cover and blinded hunters careered into the tree behind where George's had been hiding. No! In rage, Silent brought her shotgun to be on George. Her face was monstrous visage twisted beyond humanity. Both hammers and a shotgun cricked his home and the resulting roar sent locks and the birds shrieking and clamoring to the sky. The twin cloud shot peppered trees and tore through the ferns around George. Yet, once again, his battle-earned instincts served him well. Having dove out a hunter's path, he stayed down, pressed himself against the ground, when the civilian might have listened to his feet. He cried out as he repelled his stuck exposed on his shoulder and back puncturing his coat and, no doubt, the skin flesh beneath. The hunter heard George's cry and came out to untending, twitching. The manibals working furiously as it attempted to smell its location. I had only moments before I found George before it finished him off and came looking for us. Even less before Sunlight reloaded her shotgun and blasted us into bloody fragments. I drew the last of my veils into hiding place within my coat, my final gift of the Falcon and the alchemists. Rumo, Captain, hold your breath. And then I smashed the vial against the nearest tree. The reaction began as soon as the substance it open air, fast turning the liquid into blowing cloud of choking smoke. Troubling humans, nauseous and even dangerous to most colors, whose respiratory anatomy includes breathing tubes that line abdomen. A person can immediately close their mouth and pinch their nose against their fumes. color, this takes a little more effort and more importantly, a little more time. The hunter seared up, choking up a glowing cloud. Now the numb of the scent was blind to our faces. Similarly, sunlight was lurching away into the forest, desperate to escape the toxic fog. Although her skin appeared identical to human skin, I knew it different in one important way. It was breathable, allowing an ear to pass through it that the concealed multitude of creatures wouldn't suffocate. Yet, I knew Farland's gift wouldn't kill these colors. It was made to disorient, not destroy. 
It brought us some precious seconds. My guns lay there and thrown wear them down. Too far away. By the time I reached them and drew ahead of the hunter, we'd be dead. Wemo, grab the captain. Fortunately, Wicca's reflexes was the hardened by the way in George's. Spring into the captain. By side and had the man on his feet fraction of moments. As I joined them, sling George's arm over my shoulder, wrapping his arm around its back to support him. I reached out to my mind, had gone before clinging glade. This time I wasn't searching for clues. This time I was planting them. Fear. As we staggered off together into the forest, I gathered my fear, my doubt, my visions of the ultimately death I might still suffer, and they cast them into the opposite direction. A disgusting of anxiety here, a splattering of desperation here. The raw motions of the quarry laid out of the blinded color to sense and pursue. I had the smallest hope that it would work, and that emotion I buried deep, shoveling gray, numbling thoughts of a survival over the less of the hunt of find that one silver of hope in the morass of fear and decide to follow it instead. We plunged to the forest, simply determined to put one in fr foot in front of the other. George did his best to support himself, pushing dodges and despite of his injuries, only allowing Wika and me to, to lend him a hand in his bloody betrayed, his force of will. Several long minutes later, I chanced to glance over my shoulder, searched to push of any sign of pursuit. So far, nothing, but I did know how long that would last. We need to find shelter. Somewhere sturdy that we can easily defend. Defend? With what? Sticks and stones? I have five shuttles left. Do you have five gold watches to go with them? George shook his head before turning to me. Despite the obvious pain in his eyes, he managed a weak smile. <laughs> There's a service tunnel not far from here. I had it fitted with an iron gate to prevent thieves from finding their way into the mine. You have the key? It shouldn't be locked. I left it open since the accident. Then let's not stand around here talking. Agreed. George pointed out the way into the sanded side of the mountain clambering through the bush of the best he could. The tunnel proved to be mercifully close. However, it wasn't to be a refugee we'd hoped for. At least, it wasn't to be our refugee. Not yet. For someone else had got there before us. B.D. Goodwin
What the bloody hell are, lot, are you lot doing here? She peered out from the tunnel through the bars of a gate, clearly locked from the inside. Her eyes settled on moonlight, and her lips curled into a hint of a smile. You finally get what you deserve, our King George. George grimaced with pain as he gently pushed Weka and me aside and stood as straight as he could manage. Bridget Goodwin, let's put aside your obvious distaste for me a moment and consider this. Neither Weka nor Miss Winter have done the slightest wrong. And they're going to die if you don't let us into that mine shaft right now. Betty pointed at Wicker with a finger, gnarled by years of manual labor. No wrongs. He bloody shot at me. If I'd meant to hit you, Biddy, I would have. Biddy glowered at him. Disbelieving. If you didn't mean to shoot at me, then why bloody shoot at me? You were about to get yourself killed. I wasn't gonna shoot no one. I just wanted to scare that lying sunlight bitch into soiling her bloomers. Cassie didn't know that. Could we please save the conjecture about what I do or don't know until they're safely behind bars? Got something nasty after you, huh? That's right. And unless you let us in, you're going to have three more deaths on your conscience. Who says I got any deaths on my conscience now? If I didn't get Biddy to open the gate, we three would be dead within moments. It was a tricky one. If I tried to intimidate Biddy into opening the gate, she might just uh, dig her heels in and uh, be in a bloody-minded disposition. Yet, Biddy also seemed to have a knack for seeing through attempts to manipulate her. Yes, a really tricky one. Intimidate Biddy. Captain Moonlight, you have my permission to shoot this woman if she doesn't open this gate. Despite his obvious reservations, George had the presence of a mind to immediately draw this pistol to reveal at a bitty as to prevent her from escaping deeper into the tunnel. Biddy froze and stared at George, wide, open wide with shock. You bloody wouldn't. Cassie, under what authority are you requesting that I shoot Miss Goodwin? The Order of the Falcon holds a legal agreement with all European colonial governments stating that any person suspecting being in the thrall of a color may be arrested or executed if they pose the physical threat to any agent or person assisting that agent. The agreement was true. My use of it was bending the rule to the point of breaking. 
Weka, you're going to stand by and let them do this to me. If you open the gate, I'll be more than happy to act as your advocate. This is your last chance, Biddy. I'll give you uh, a count of... An eerie wail echoed through the forest, silenced my words in my throat. I tried it once, and there it was. The hunter, no more than a hundred yards away. Though its eyes remained damaged, blinded, its antenna worked furiously back and forth examining our scent. Behind us was a heavy lock clicked and the barred gate swung open at the resounding screech. The color cocked its head left and then right and like a curious dog and then it was charging through the bush bearing down on us with Frightening speed. <laughs> Wicked and I threw George inside. He collided with B, and the, and the two went down together, entangled in a crisped heap. <laughs> then peeped after George, and I gripped the gate and slammed it in the monster's gashing and screeching face. I turned the key to lock then rather than heard the satisfying click on the iron safety and then stepped back and observed the mighty predator before us. Once, twice, it tested the gate and slamming its great jaws against it and although the dust and sand stripped it down from the above the ground, the portals itself shed its ground. Clearly understanding the, the futility of pounding the gate, the hunter became a butt motionless, its blinding eyes seemingly fixed upon us. Only its an antenna moved, switching back and forth with ceaseless gestulations as it gathered on our scent and at our refugee. And then, as if satisfied that it had learned enough, it turned and gored its way into the bush. By this time, Biddy and George had managed to disentangle themselves enough for Biddy to retrieve for whiskey bottle. She proceeded to strain as this starred wide-eyed and the occupied only moments before the monstrous union beyond any drunken nightmare she'd ever had. Bugger me. So that was a collar, was it? One type of collar, yes. What do you mean, one type? There's others out there? Sunlight. What about her? She's a color, masquerading as our cheerful neighborhood innkeep. Figures. Can't trust anyone who smiles that much. She walked over to the bulging sack of that lay on the earthen floor nearby and produced another bottle of whiskey from its innards. You seem to have made yourself rather at home here, Biddy. I can only assume that your drinking chum, the late foreman Arthur Evans, supplied you with the key. Yep. Already figured I might need a place to hide in case I ever got good and mad enough to finally shoot you in the liver like you deserve. Oh, 
Oh, did not go through. I'm sorry. Not Very kind right. of him. I had no idea you were such a popular gent, Captain Moonlight. I didn't get the gold mining business to make friends, Mr. Jones. Clearly. I walked over to Biddy's supply and obtained it up to see what was inside. Oh, that's mine. Not anymore, Biddy. Your supplies have just been requisitioned by the Order of the Falcon. You may gain appropriate compensation by representing your local falconer with an invoice and a detailed inventory of the items requisitioned. That is, if there's anything in here besides booze. Thankfully, there was. Preserves, cured ham, and enough water to last. Looks like you're you're going to experience a death dell pain if you don't tell me the truth. Uh, sorry about that. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I, there, just rolled, I just rolled with it. <laughs> is there a back the history? Oh, crap, where were we? Holy smokes. Did, did we really skip that much? It skipped a good chunk. <laughs> it just kept telling me until we see something that looks familiar. No way it skipped that much, did it? Uh, you guys tell me. <laughs> oh my god. None of this looks familiar. None of this no. is familiar. <laughs> Whoa, wait, whoa, 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 there it is, there it is, yeah, there yeah, it is, okay. that bit with the invoice. <laughs> Thankfully, oh no my god, enough water. <laughs> so much text it skipped. We can go down. <laughs> A little bit, yeah, about there. Wait, did you yeah. skip? Uh, I don't understand, did you repeat it? It all got skipped accidentally. Somehow that it got skipped. Been, yeah, there's probably that a button to fast forward. I was going to say, that might have been the fastest fast forward I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it went, it went yeah. so far. <laughs> yeah. That was cool. That was a test. I was just rolling with it. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, that top one was where we were up to. I believe that was... Yeah, I think there. Want me to go? Read it for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a mind to kick you all out again. Let you take your chances with them callers. It, it's a bugger having a conscious, eh, buddy? <laughs> Damn right about that. I turned to George, who was going, is doing his best to make himself comfortable. To little avail. Uh... How are you holding up, Captain? My shirt and jacket seem to be staunched to bleeding. I look forward to seeing this Dr. McAllister, yet it seems I shall live in the meantime. Sunlight's pellets have thankfully missed the more vital spots. Glad to hear it. That makes one of us. Hitty, if we're all going to get out of this alive, we're going to have to at least put up with each other. So, if you could kindly keep your death wishes to yourself. Betty's reply came in the form of a grunt and a loud gulp of a whiskey. Thank you. I looked over to Wika to see how he was doing, only to find him farther into the tunnel, peering into the darkness. You're right, Wermo. <clears throat> as good as can be expected. He turned and addressed George. This being a service tunnel, 
I'm guessing it leads into the main shaft. Which, thanks to a certain explosion, is now completely filled with rubble. Any tunnels leading off it that we might be able to be able to navigate? I'm afraid not. There's sample tunnels, dead ends. Our only means of exit is through that gate. And into the rather nasty set of mandibles waiting for us on the other side. Precisely. And speaking of certain explosions, I can only assume that sunlight was the culprit. It wouldn't follow, yes. On one foray with Farlan, the alchemist had advised me to practice the falcon expressions in the minor. I turned into Biddy and fixed her with a most, I hoped, and suitably intimidating gaze. Looks like you're going to experience a great deal of pain if you don't tell me the truth. Biddy glared back at me. You look constipated, Falconer. Maybe you should go see Dr. McAllister, too. He has a fine line of suppositories that you could. Biddy, just tell me the truth. What happened between you, Maggie, and Jimmy? Jimmy? My safety officer, Jimmy. Jimmy. Yes, I was rather wondering about that as well. Shouldn't we be rather talking about how to kill us a bloody Kohler? We only include people I trust. People who aren't going to shoot me in the back as soon as the job is done. Then you'd be wanting to have a chat with these other two buggers while you're at it. Wouldn't trust either of them to pour me a drink, I wouldn't. Wermo, I trust. The captain! I gave George a speculative glance, which he returned with a raised eyebrow. He seemed more amused than offended at my hesitation. I would have said no up until the point we have risked his own arise to save Wirmo and I... I'd do it again if required. Thank you. Seconded. Although I'm inclined to think that I was somewhat extraneous to your salvation plans. How so? In my experience, you colonials tend to look out for each other. You need Cassie here to save your town and your precious gold mine. Me, I'm just a brown boy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ha! He's got you there. George's expression grew cold as it shifted from Wika to Pity. I won't deny that my primary concern lay with Miss Winter. See? Out for himself until the grim and dirty end, that one. I think that's quite enough out of you, Biddy. You're not Lord of the Manor now, King George. You're just another rat in a hole, hiding from the great blood cat stalking about outside. So I reckon I offer Cassie here a trade. What sort of trade? I'll tell you what part I played in the first explosion at the mine if Moonlight there tells you what part he played. 
Now this is going to be interesting. I couldn't agree more. I fixed George in, uh, with a fine-tuned redemption of my tell-me-the-truth stare. It seemed to work a little better this time. The frost flawed from George's face. There was a genuine misery behind it. Misery born of guilt. I didn't intend for those men to die. I swear to God. And we stop here for tonight? Okay. Cliffhanger. Of course. That's how yeah. I always intend to end my sessions. <laughs> that is a cliffhanger. By the way, 